Hello, everyone. Um, good to see you all here, and thanks for joining us. Hope it's not too chilly. I have to stand up because um, I can't. Otherwise, I can't see uh, Christian. I'll sit down in a sec. Um, if we had been meeting uh, two, three months ago, I think this would be one of those really depressing Davos sessions uh, <laughs> because inflation was on a tear, um, Ukraine war was was raging. Um, it was. Uh, it, it felt as if we were Europe was going into a deep recession. The good news is that we're not we're not there. Um, I am generally a lot more optimistic. Um, much to Putin's dismay, uh, Europe is not likely to suffer more than more than Russia. Not in the medium term, not in the long term, and and not even in the short term. Gas prices are back to pre-war levels. Inflation seems to have peaked. Um, although I'm sure we were we will hear a lot more about core inflation in this session. Um, the question to me, and the one, one that I will be also putting to the panel, is what are the medium-term prospects? Because there are still very big challenges, whether it's from pressure from the US on IRA, on decoupling, from China, still have tight labor markets, and energy costs that are not going back to where, to where they used to be. So. Uh, I couldn't have hoped for a better panel. Uh, Christine Lagarde, president of uh, the European Central Bank, Valdis Dombrovskis, European Trade Commissioner, Andrei Plenković, Prime Minister of Croatia, Mark Rutte, of course, Prime Minister of the Netherlands, and Christian Suing, CEO of Deutsche Bank. Um, Mrs. Lagarde, I'm going to uh, start with you to give us a bit of an overview of your expectations for um, this year. And more specifically, what do you need to see to be more confident that we are on the right tra trajectory when it comes to inflation? What are you looking at? Well, first of all, I look, first of all, good morning to everyone and thank you for being, uh, being here. But the first thing that we look at is the activity and the activity on a global basis, the activity at the euro area level. And I agree with you uh, that the news have become uh, much uh, more positive in the last few weeks. And, uh, you know, the rhetoric has moved from recession in Q3, Q4 and possibly plus to recession in Q4 and Q1 of 23 to now this small contraction and with leaders of some of the major uh, players in Europe actually arguing that there will be no recession. Uh, I think the case made by Olaf uh, Scholz uh, on Germany a couple of days ago was, was explicit. So we look at that and what we are seeing at the moment is clearly an activity that uh, is declining compared with an excellent 2022 where growth was 3.4 uh, to a growth projections that we have for 23 of uh, 0.5. So it's not uh, a brilliant uh, year, but it is a lot better than what we had feared. So we start with that. And then, of course, our focus is inflation. I'll come to that in a second, but I'd like to point out one other factor which we look at, which is critically important for our assessment of inflation expectations and inflation evolution, and that is the job market. And the job market in Europe has uh, never been as vibrant as it is now. The unemployment number is rock bottom compared with what we've had in the last 20 years. And uh, the participation rate, which matters as well, uh, is also at a very, very high level. And that is pretty much uh, homogeneous uh, throughout uh, the euro area. Now, you asked me about inflation, and inflation is obviously the prime mission and the primary objective of uh, the ECB because our mission is to procure price stability without which growth, investment, decisions by economic actors uh, is going to be hampered. So on inflation, we have way too high numbers. Uh, I know that a lot of uh, journalists made a big fuss about the fact that headline numbers had gone down uh, most recently. Uh, and you also mentioned yourself that we have to look at core inflation, which is certainly uh, critically important. So we look at all the composition of inflation, from headline to core to sticky to uh, stripped out, uh, all sorts of uh, elements. And inflation, 
by all accounts, however you look at it, is way too high. Uh, and our determination at the ECB is to bring it back to 2% uh, in a timely manner and taking all the measures that we have to take in order to do that, which is why we have already increased interest rates by 250 basis points. And, uh, and we shall stay the course until such time when we have moved into restrictive territory for long enough so that we can return inflation to 2% in a timely manner. Do you think it is becoming entrenched? What you need to do for that is, <clears throat> what, we, what we do is we look very carefully at inflation expectations because that, that, that's a, a key driver. And we are not seeing inflation expectations uh, de-anchoring uh, in any significant way. It, it, it varies a little bit around two. Uh, we look at surveys, we look at market expectations, we try to measure in all shapes and forms, but inflation expectations uh, are not de-anchoring and what we have to avoid is that they be at risk of de-anchoring. So when we, when we think about growth, um, we hear a lot of um, investors um, worried that there could be, that you could tighten, the ECB could tighten too much, um, especially if, as expected, inflation sort of drops quite precipitously to, let's say, let's say 4%. And, that, you know, I'm sure everyone here has heard at Davos the, this magic 4% that everyone think, thinks we're going to get to fairly, fairly quickly. Does anyone on the panel worry about uh, over-tightening? Christian, no, I, no, no, I, I see you. <laughs> I'm not worried. I mean, uh, because first of all, I, I have to say that I think the ECB has done exactly the right thing since uh, the last summer. And I can only encourage, and I'm uh, appreciating uh, the comments from Christine, um, that she's clearly saying we are staying the course. Because I think the worst what can happen is that we bring inflation not under control. Inflation is the thing which is a poison for the economy. and. While I agree to all the comments that there is more optimism in the economy, the underlying problems which we have in Europe, high inflation, also certain other structural reforms, are not gone. And if we come into the situation that we potentially get inflation a bit down, but over time we never get control of it, then we come into the spiral that we also have from other participants in the economies, like the unions, we will get a different answer because I think they have remained very calm they have played, in my view, um, together with the corporates uh, and with all the participants, a game that we can, over time, um, tame now the inflation. So I think this consequent answer is exactly the right thing. And then there is one more worry I have, and that is, you know, if China, and this is again uh, one of the reasons why the uh, economy is now looking a bit, a, bit, uh, a bit better. But we also need to watch what kind of impact the opening of China has on our inflation. And therefore, it is so important that we keep the consequent line uh, Christine just uh, laid out. And I think that is more important because if we get that under control, I'm absolutely convinced that Europe can grow um, in the medium and long term. And that's the most important. Clearly, the inflation has, has also eased a bit because of Chinese demand, because Chinese demand, especially for energy, was depressed. And China is definitely um, reopening. But, um, Commissioner, I, just, I, I wanted to get you on uh, fiscal policy. You have warned that fiscal and monetary policy have to go in the same direction, uh, which, of course, is not the case in, in some countries. Can governments start reducing their budget deficits and move to a, a stricter fiscal <coughs> policy? And is that what you, what you really want to see right now? Uh, well, uh Indeed, uh, if we uh, want to respond to uh, current uh, economic uh, circumstances, which is in any case uh, slowing growth and high inflation, uh, we need to have consistent macroeconomic uh, policy mix. So there needs to be uh, indeed uh, consistency between monetary policy and uh, fiscal policy. They cannot work at cross uh, purposes. Uh, that's uh, why uh, uh, our, our recommendation as European Commission's recommendation for this year is to have a broadly neutral fiscal stance in the euro area uh, uh, and uh, where we see uh, possibilities to bring down a budget uh, deficit uh, is uh, related to um, uh, how well the support measures for uh, uh, 
energy for households and businesses are targeted uh, because around 70% of the support uh, measures are not targeted, uh, so it uh, amounts to uh, substantial fiscal uh, stimulus, but it uh, actually feeds into inflation. It does not uh, send the uh, price signal, does not help reduce energy uh, uh, demand, uh, and thus uh, does not help also to reduce uh, energy uh, prices. So, so, so you want the second phase of the support to be a lot more targeted towards yes, the most and, vulnerable uh, we groups. have concretely also came with a concrete model which we propose to member states, so-called two-tier pricing systems that up to certain consumption level consumers receive subsidized price and about this consumption level uh, paying uh, the market price so uh, basically having this uh, uh, intention also to reduce uh, on the uh, consumption side so that is one thing that we need consistent policy uh, mix another of course we need to do also targeted measures to get uh, uh, energy prices down uh, because uh, that uh, uh, that issue will remain with uh, us we uh, uh, we are having uh, elevated uh, energy prices. There are forecasts that well, fossil fuel prices will stay elevated for a foreseeable time. We have seen lots of volatility. So uh, uh, on one hand, we have done lots of also uh, market intervention uh, measures to deal with those specific issues. Uh, uh, on another hand, we are accelerating our green transition, so moving faster towards renewables, uh, towards uh, energy efficiency measures. But that, of course, means that we need to sustain also this uh, investment for those purposes, and that's where our recovery and resilience facility comes in, and this year should be the uh, peak year for disbursements of recovery and resilience yeah. facilities. That's where our repower EU plans come uh, in. Uh, but uh, what I also wanted to emphasize on the energy side, we also need to continue to deal with energy security of supply issues. Uh, because, um, yes, this uh, winter we have uh, plenty of gas in the storages, so we can be confident we'll go through the winter. Uh, but this winter, we still have lots of Russian gas in our storages, which was pumped in the first half of the last year. And this is not going to be the case next winter. So we'll still have to seek yet substantial additional uh, gas supplies from other uh, uh, providers also for the next uh, uh, winter. And that's in a context, as you mentioned, where China's economy is opening yeah. up and also maybe uh, seeking more gas uh, uh, supplies. So there are still challenges ahead of us. Uh Prime Minister, I see you nodding. Is it? Are, are you worried about storage? Because you, you could get a combination of a, you know, storage f facilities that are not um, full, uh, a harsher winter. Because even though the weather here has been miserable, actually we've had a mild. We're having a mild winter, yeah. and China demand coming back. I'm not overly worried, but we have to stay concentrated on this issue. And uh, it has to do with uh, refill the storage capacity. We also need to make sure that we, we are doubling in my country the LNG uh, imports. Uh, Germany is uh, massively uh, building uh, these floating LNG terminals. And at the same time, of course, we have to work on the energy transition for the longer term. Now, my, my worry is more on the previous subject. And that is inflation in combination with low longer term growth prospects for Europe. And I strongly believe we have to do a few things at the same time. We have to bring down government borrowing. It's still too high in Italy and France and other countries and our big economies. And that is really hampering long term growth. And in the short term, we had to spend hundreds of billions, as Europe, also the Netherlands, to support household incomes. Low income on lower incomes, the middle incomes, logically, otherwise you would have uh, big issues uh, with people not being able to uh, pay for the energy prices and the energy bills. But longer term, this is not sustainable. So they have to become more targeted. And for the shorter term, somehow we need to offset those extra spendings with savings wherever we can find them or extra economic growth opportunities. Because otherwise it could fuel inflation in itself. So for the longer term, for me, it means bringing down government borrowing. It's crucial in, in all of the European Union, but particularly in some of the big economies, whilst at the same time, and this is particularly difficult, uh, put in place the necessary structural reforms, particularly in the pension sectors. When you look at Italy and France and some other countries, they are spending 10 to 15% of GDP on pensions. Yeah. 
And, and that money is gone. I mean, it's fantastic, of course, that you can do that, but in the Netherlands we are spending 5% on pensions. So that gives you a 10% extra space to invest in, in education, in, in innovation, or just to lower taxation. And longer term, that is not sustainable. Now, I'm happy that uh, the French have now decided to, uh, to move on the pension issue. Uh, my sister was just retiring at age 68. In France, I can retire at age 64 by 2030, but at least that step is now being taken, and still you will see that society in France yeah, will now uh, storm the Elysee to, because they do not agree. Let, let's not be happy about it. It might be a bit too term. early to be congratulating the French. No, exactly. Yeah. So, so, but, but we have to. <laughs> but we also need to message, I believe, uh, collectively that this is crucial because we do not want Europe to become a sort of museum where you go to because of the beautiful cities. It has to be the place of growth, of innovation, uh, of industry base, and and and. Government borrowing under control, structural reforms in place is the risk recipe for this. And I'm extremely happy with this commissioner because this is exactly uh, the recipe he is following. Um, lots to come back to. Uh, Prime Minister Plenkovic, well, congratulations. You are, uh, you've just passed a huge milestone. You've joined the Euro. How's that going for you? Well, the feeling is very good. Uh, I have to admit it was an exercise of a six years uh, long and uh, very well accompanied uh, reforms internally and also with the whole dialogue that we had with the Commission, with the ECB, with the um, Eurogroup, and um, it was a, a great success. I think the, the main frame, I would say, the, the punchline is that Croatia is less exposed and better protected in the crisis being a member of the Eurozone. We are also the only country of the European Union ever to have joined both Eurozone and Schengen area on the same day. And here I think in particular, Mark, this was also a long uh, uh, and tough process. So we have transformed our international position literally uh, three weeks ago. Uh, in terms of preparation, technically what the state was responsible for, enough euro banknotes, enough euro coins, cash machines functioning, transfer of payments, perfect, not a single problem. What we witnessed is that some of the economic operators used the occasion of rounding a little bit more than it was reasonable. Mm -hmm. But now we are addressing this issue, trying to convince them that if you had a government which along all of the other partners in Europe was intervening in terms of state interventionism heavily for, to, in order to create a buffer for the externally based crisis, a horizontal one, Russia's aggression in, in Ukraine, energy crisis, food crisis, inflatory pressure. We did well. We had a very comprehensive package of 3.6 billion euros for our citizens and companies. Then we felt that the part of the social responsibility of all the actors, actors in our market is to behave adequately. And in this respect, uh, there is a, a little bit fine tuning to be done, but I think it will calm down. So our feeling is that um, Croatia has managed to keep the inflation at 10.8% in the last year which is lower than other countries of the EU who are from Central and Eastern Europe and do not wish to join the Eurozone yet. They have higher one. So I think we did a very good preparation. I think we have enough fiscal capacity over the past couple of years to, st to sustain uh, the targeted support of the most vulnerable in this 2023. And we've done a really a great job in terms of regulating prices of electricity, gas, and also the oil, oil derivatives. So with these three elements, because energy is the, I would say, the main source of our problem, because if we address this issue, all the others will fall in place, including the inflation, that we have so far done very well. And with this stronger position, I expect that even though we'll have a lower uh, growth of GDP in uh, 2023 than, of course, in this year, we expect it to be around 6%, but still it will not put us in a position where we couldn't cope with all the challenges that are ahead. So I would say a positive <coughs> conclusion for 2022 and less pessimistic for 2023. On the contrary, and the whole atmosphere I've seen here in Davos uh, seems to be going in that direction. That is already a good signal. Absolutely. Um, I want to move the discussion now a little bit to, towards um, what, what, the, what Europe needs to bolster its competitiveness. Um, Mrs. Lagarde, I know you have very specific ideas. <laughs> well, thank you very much. Um, 
And if you want to oh, comment on anything yeah, that, yeah, was, no, that was I, said, I absolutely. completely support many of the points that have been made by, by colleagues uh, on the panel. But I think as we are, by necessity, uh, moving towards this twin transition of digital and green, uh, to put it simply, and that was perfectly identified in Next Generation EU and in the um, Recovery and uh, Resilience Fund that was set up. So we have to move towards digital and green transition. We know that the financing for that is going to be phenomenal. Uh, according to the Commission numbers, if I recall, uh, Valdis, it's half a trillion dollar that will be needed uh, from now until 2030 in order to move fast in those steps that will give us more independence, less vulnerability uh, towards uh, the foes of this world. And if we have to do that, we need to take <coughs> rapid steps. Step number one, in my view, and I know that this is shared uh, by other members of the panel, we need to get really serious, determined, and fast on capital market union. Some of you in this room have heard about capital market union for the last 10 years. I have too. But there are a few nuts that need to be cracked in order for capital market union to actually happen. I am less optimistic about banking union, but capital market union, we can do it. If there is enough political impetus, there is goodwill at the Commission to actually do the work that needs to be done. It's the single point of entry. It's the bankruptcy law that needs to be slightly harmonized a bit further, a bit better. It's tax measures that have now been agreed at the OECD and that need to be ratified across the, Euro the European Union, as I'm sure it will before January 24. And more needs to be done in order to have one single uh, supervisory authority in order to make sure that that capital market union actually work. This is not enough, but it has to be done. Why is that? Because public money will not suffice. Public money will crowd out private investment, but public money could certainly be blended with private money in order to finance those significant investment. <coughs> so my suggestion is that we move ahead fast and that we look at all the additional measures that need to be taken. If you look, for instance, at research that uh, was conducted at the ECB, equity is the best way to channel money to those sectors that require innovation. It's a simple fact. It's demonstrated by academics and by review. Well, guess what? If the tax rules are such that you actually encourage debt rather than equity, how do we think that we're going to mobilize equity now? The Commission has moved. We need to continue that movement in order to encourage equity, and there's plenty of money around, to go towards those investments that will transition us to a place where we are less vulnerable, more independent, more sovereign, and if CBDC, Digital Euro, can accompany the process, I'll be even happier. Um, let me ask you, Commissioner, about the IRA, because you have said that the IRA could drive more European companies closer to China and thus, and thus run counter to what the US, in fact, wants to achieve. And there's now a task force at the White House. There are, there are talks. Um, have, you, have, you felt, have you seen any progress at Davos? Because this has been a major uh, topic of discussion. Uh, yeah, maybe uh, before I move to uh, Inflation Reduction Act and our uh, discussions with U.S., uh, just uh, uh, really express the full support on this work stream on the Capital Markets Union. Uh, that's indeed uh, critical uh, for us to move uh, forward, both to finance our green and digital transitions and to ensure overall the competitiveness of European economy. Uh, uh, Europe is very good as regards the uh, startups landscape, uh, but then when it comes to scaling up companies, we see many companies going scaling up to US, to, to Asia, to other places, well, primarily US and Asia. Uh, and uh, 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 thus, of course, uh, it means that those companies are not uh, creating all the jobs and economic activities uh, in the EU. So capital markets union can be important part of this answer. Uh, but to move to the Inflation uh, uh, Reduction Act, uh, uh, indeed, uh, when we are uh, discussing green uh, transition, obviously we welcome the aims of the uh, Inflation Reduction Act that the U.S. is uh, 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 working seriously also on its green transition uh, against climate change. Uh, but our concern is that it's done in a discriminatory way. And uh, in a sense, it's not uh, helping to build uh, transatlantic value chains on the green transition, but rather uh, actually severing those uh, value chains. 
So uh, uh, that's why we are indeed engaged at uh, different levels with U.S. And just earlier this week, I had a, uh, discussions on this with U.S. trade representative, Katrin Tai in Brussels. Uh, Does she understand? Uh, well, uh, uh, and that's why we have this uh, uh, also EU-US joint task force, which deals with this issue. Uh, we have, uh, I would say, halfway satisfactory uh, solutions on uh, clean vehicles uh, tax credits, but there are many other areas which we need to uh, address. On some areas, there are some openings from the US uh, side. So. Uh, uh, we continue to work. We know that further uh, kind of uh, delegated acts coming from the Inflation De uh, Reduction Act will be prepared uh, by March. So uh, we st uh, still have a bit of a time. So we'll have to see how far we'll be able to uh, go in terms of addressing our concerns. And, uh, then but, but you think there is an acknowledgement now in the U.S. that they, they set they decided on the IRA without regards to because this was an American. You know, I mean, I heard a senator say, "We never, we didn't think for a second about Europe. This was not about Europe." Um, and so you're all having now to explain the impact and the consequences. Uh, well, you know, uh, uh, I, I would not uh, see just like an omission. You know, if it was omission, mm -hmm. it was probably easier to correct. Uh, uh, but we all know that also President Biden was campaigning on Buy American. Yeah. And this is some kind of manifestation of Buy American. So uh, I think also through this uh, engagement, we'll be able to solve a part of our problems. We probably will not be able to uh, 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 solve all of our problems. You know, for example, some of the senators, like uh, Senator Manchin, already is uh, uh, in a sense saying that he sees also this solution on mm. uh, clean vehicles tax credits as a loophole. Uh, so by no means we can interpret it as an omission. <laughs> so, uh, 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 but uh, 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 okay, uh, as I said, there are some openings. Also, President Biden himself said the, uh, that uh, yes, Inflation Reduction Act is not meant to exclude uh, partners like European Union. So we're trying to build on this and uh, seeing how it materializes in uh, concrete decisions and how the. Uh, most uh, discriminatory aspects, most negative aspects of Inflation Reduction Act can be addressed. Uh, Christian, I know you want to, to come in probably on Capital Markets Union, but I wanted to also just raise the broader question of we are in a, in, in, in a phase now of deglobalization or at least constraints on, on globalization. And that has ramifications for, for European growth. And I'd be very interested, um, Prime Minister Rutta also from, uh, from you, um, to hear what, how, how do you deal with this? Because you have a specific case, for example, with semiconductors. Yeah, we have to deal, of course, with both issues, eh? the, the, the yeah. Inflation Reduction Act. It's, it's, it's funny. We constantly were beating the Americans, you're not doing enough. And now they implement legislation, yeah. which yeah. will close the gap with the Paris Agreement. And now we're saying, no, but not, not in this way. <laughs> uh, it's a bit silly. And, um, and we should have a bit more self-confidence. So I hear some voices in Europe saying we should get rid of the state aid rules. Well, that will mean the end of the internal market. And there are some saying we need more European funding. Well, well there is so the much. State aid uh, rules are going to be loosened yeah, from what I heard it, it, from what I heard two days ago. Targeted and chirurgical, that's OK. Yeah. But let's ma make sure that not some people could now implement their agenda who want to get rid anyway of most of the state aid rules. And that's one of the reasons why the European Union is so successful and the internal market is so successful. And also this whole idea of another common funding project, I, I'm not for it. I mean, we have so much common money in the budget, in the uh, resilience uh, fund, which came out of uh, COVID. Um, and again, also here, I mean, my country is investing 35 billion between now and 2030 in the energy transition. Uh, and, and we also have to make sure that we have that space in our budgets at the national level. It cannot all be done at the European level. So um, uh, I think we can get there. Uh, and with the Americans, I think it is a mix of unintended consequences. But I think the commission is right. We should not be naive. Uh, uh, Biden has been campaigning on Buy American, so there must be some of the element of that. But I do believe that they want to, 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 with us, try to solve most of these issues. And I know the Commission is working on that. And I'm not, not really um, pessimistic that we can get there. And on, on China, I mean, the main issue in Europe is we have no coordinated China policy. Yeah. We have never been able to do that. Uh, and that has also has to do that we do not have a 
common foreign policy. Because in the end, at the end of the day, the big economies will still conduct their own foreign policy, which I understand. But at least you should coordinate better, strategize dialogue on China and on other countries. And the U.S. has a very clear China strategy, which is not necessarily exactly what we want. Um, but but I'm, I'm not very clear on exactly what do you want, because you, you can't, you, it's very we, we difficult can, to balance, you know, satisfying the Americans <clears throat> and maintaining uh, trade and commercial relations to the extent that uh, you have them today. So, I mean, I hear often, you know, we want to... You can't have it, but you're going to have to go in one direction or the other. Yeah, but it's not that we have to choose between the U.S. and China. We need to have our own policy. And our, our own policy should be, first of all, that we have the mindset that we want to be a player and not a playing field. And the risk now, without enough coordination on China and other foreign policy issues, is that we become the playing field and we're not a player. And even France, Germany, Italy, Spain, the Netherlands, we are too small to do it on our own. We have to do it collectively, these big issues. Um, and uh, on China, that means, of course, we, we, it's, it's, it's there, it's, it's uh, one and a half billion people. It is an economy which now had this, the sluggiest growth since uh, 1976, 19, yeah, 1976, but still, it is a huge economy with a huge potential, uh, with a huge innovation base, so we have to deal with that. And at the same time, we have legitimate security concerns. Long term, we want to make sure that we keep leading edge on, for example, semicon here in Europe and the US. We want to make sure that supply chains are not disrupted. We want to make sure that it's not just China, other, also other countries, that we know that some of these high-end uh, chips can be used in defense, um, uh, uh, in defense systems. So we all have to, have to take that into consideration. And, and we are in, in dialoguing with uh, many of our partners, including the US, how to best deal with that. I think we will get to a common outcome, uh, particularly uh, on Semicon, but this all originates again from the fact that in Europe, this is not the Commission, eh? this is the, Europe, the member states yeah. not being able to, uh, to coordinate uh, sufficiently. Uh, Prime Minister Plankovic, do you want to come in on this? Yes, uh, when it comes to what is our uh, main task as, as leaders of the government, uh, you have the theoretical context, you have the institutional framework, you have the international organizations, but you have electors, elections, and your own people who need to see that the state, which is the closest one that they can see that can help them, can actually act. And in this last three years, and I said this last year at the panel, the only element which made the social cohesion to be kept properly was the state interventionism. State interventionism. And people recognized that. There was no other actor who could replace the state. And that's why the efforts which we are doing now after prolonged COVID, after Russia's aggression to Ukraine, energy crisis, food crisis, inflation, of course that we need to be more flexible when it comes to state aid rules. We can't pretend that everything is normal, because it's not. And we need to find measures which are adequate to be anti-cyclical of what Christine is doing by increasing the interest rate, but we need to be able to have a targeted subsidies to our companies and citizens that they can go through the period for which they are not guilty. And they cannot solve it themselves, especially smaller economies. What Mark has said about the EU's policy or the EU member states' policy vis-a-vis -vis China, there were moments when smaller countries were, let's say, being put to test why do you have this dialogue, China plus 16, 17, some countries have left. And then you look at the trade. Every single day, the European Union trades one billion, one billion with China. The entire Croatia's trade with China is only one day of the EU's trade with China. And when we look at the numbers, you see that everybody is, at the end of the day, pragmatic. There is a big difference between China and Russia. What Russia has done to Ukraine, I don't see with all my background of being a, a former diplomat and someone that has spent a lot of time in foreign policy, I don't see the, a, par a parallel threat. I see a specific global context for the America, but I don't, I don't see a similar parallel threat that would endanger our economy, our way of, way of life, and our security. Mm -hmm. And this is where the specific uh, view with China comes from all of us together. And I think this is important <coughs> to understand. There is no total <laughs> alignment immediately as a reflex. There is a pragmatic approach where if we are together, of course, we are more influential. If we are fragmented, the one who is bigger, stronger, will have sure. a better end in the negotiations. It's like in every single walk of life that we can imagine. 
I wonder whether uh, <coughs> the U.S. administration actually accepts this this argument. I mean, I you know I I understand what you're saying, and I hear it a lot in Europe. But I I wonder whether the U.S. administration actually appreciates. Um, that position. I think they but, want. But, but, I think they want you. I think they want you. They would like you to be more aggressive. But but still, I mean, the European Union is the biggest internal market in world history, <laughs> and the collect and, and and the added up of the European uh, internal market is bigger than the US. So it's not that we have to constantly please them. Uh, we we do have security concerns. The US has security concerns, and and at Augenhöhe, the Germans would say. So uh, looking each other into the eye without. Uh, presenting yourself as a sort of junior partner. We can get there, I'm absolutely convinced. The Americans want that also. I mean, it's also in their interest that this part of the world stays successful mm. and, and prosperous, uh, mm. given all the um, um, imbalances in the world and all the uh, ripple effects of conflicts elsewhere. So there, there's absolutely no agenda, I'm convinced, in the US to, to harm us. But they have uh, security concerns, we have our concerns, and we have to somehow um, strategize to get to an outcome. But I think we can get there. And we, we, yeah. if I can just add one thing, we are in a very different place. Uh, Europe is the first trading partner of 80 countries in the world. Yeah. US is first trading partner of 20 countries in the world. So we are in a different place. Yeah. Christian? No, I, um, I wanted to make two comments. Uh, number one, you know, it's so pleasing for me from a private industry to hear that central bank head commissioner, prime ministers are all in favor of capital markets union. The only question I have is, I've been on the board of Deutsche Bank since 2015. Why, is it why, isn't, why don't we do any progress? And therefore, I, I think this attitude which is here is exactly the right. I would even say the capital markets union is the cheapest yeah. booster to the economy we have in Europe. Yeah. And I would even go a step further, without the capital markets union, the green deal will not happen. We have two fantastic companies here, I just saw, uh, from the German corporate industries. I tell you, they have so much investments to do in order to do green transition. You mentioned the 500 billion. That is the net investment per year we have to do in Europe. Now, compare the 500 billion to the 100 billion defense extra budget Germany did, or to the 200 billion. It's impossible to do that via public finances. It's impossible that we can do it via bank balance sheets. It can only be done with private, with, uh, with the capital markets union. Now, the second part of that goes very much to the future. If you have a capital markets union, all our concerns about the venture capital market will also decrease. Because the more liquidity you get in, you also get venture capital into this market. And that is the next generation where we have to invest in. So the one thing is the transition into green and digital. But if we think about the industries which will be predominantly there in 15, 20, 25 years, we need venture capital right now. These guys will not come without the capital markets union. And so thirdly, one more sentence to that. I know it will take time. Hopefully it will take less than the six years application for the euro from now on because we are really running the clock now. But on the way there, we can already deal with less regulation, for instance, on secretarization. Mm. less regulations when yeah. it comes to ESG. I'm all in favor for one taxonomy, but let's make sure that mid-cap companies in Germany, in whatever industry, don't have to go through 7,000 of pages of ESG rules. They won't get that, and the backbone of that economy is mid-cap. So the middle step to capital markets union is also there where it's necessary without, without compromising on safety and stability, and I'm all in favor of that. Let's review regulation. I'm also in favor of less regulation. Um, let, uh, I know there are a few people who want to come in. Uh, Mehreen. Just, Just shout. Or th I think there's a mic coming. <laughs> Times, uh, a question for President Lagarde. Just in defense of some of my colleagues, you said that journalists are making a big fuss about falls in headline inflation. Markets seem to be consistently also underpricing your ability to uh, stick with it as you were. Why are you failing to convince them? And is that actually a bigger problem for your credibility than looking at inflation expectations, uh, etc.? I would invite them to revise their position. I think they would be <laughs> well advised doing so. There's a question over there and then here. We've got a few minutes. Hello, my name is Svetoslav. I came from Ukraine. 
and I'm also a proud alumni of Maastricht University. Ah, very good. So, first of all, when we speak about European growth, we need to remember there is a war in the east of Europe, in my country, but that's a war for all of us. That's our war for everybody sitting here. And I can hardly imagine sustainable growth of Europe if we don't succeed in Ukraine. Second point, probably the saddest part of my life is morning now. Every time I open social media, I see bad news. Yesterday, a friend of mine died in a helicopter crash. Um, earlier this week, we had a bombing of civilian building. Um, and I just don't want to tell how many kids died because of that. So the last point is, please help us, help me and other 40 million Ukrainians not to experience this. That's unbearable. And I do ask all of you to continue and accelerate support, financial support. We need tanks, Mr. Prime Minister. We need weapons to end this war and then to be part of global and European family. Thank you. Thank you for this uh, intervention, very, very important points. And I thought this would be one session where we don't talk about tanks, but it, it is a very important issue that is very much on everybody's mind. Please go ahead. Yeah, uh, I, I wanted uh, to uh, uh, briefly uh, come, on, uh, come in on this, because uh, indeed, also when we are talking uh, about European economy, the best way to deal with uh, uh, economic uh, consequences of the war is to stop the war. And that's why we need to stay the course. We need to continue to put pressure on Russia as aggressor state, and we need to provide all necessary uh, support to uh, Ukraine. So I fully agree uh, with this. Uh, on financial support, we have agreed on uh, uh, 18 billion euros uh, macro financial assistance plus package for this year. Uh, this week we disbursed uh, 3 billion euros and will ensure a stable funding flow uh, for Ukraine throughout the year. Uh, and this covers a uh, substantial part of the Ukraine's financing need for this uh, year. Of course, we expect other uh, international donors to do uh, uh, their uh, part. On uh, military supplies, uh, obviously, it's, uh, it, it's a must, because uh, if we allow uh, uh, Russia to make gains, this war will only uh, spread. So here, really, Ukraine is not fighting only for itself. It's fighting for the whole a democratic world and for the uh, entire uh, European security architecture. And it must have all our support. <coughs> well, from EU, for the first time in history, we are providing military uh, financial support also for military equipment through our European uh, peace facility. We have mobilized 3.1 billion euros for this to uh, help uh, finance also member states' uh, supplies uh, uh, to uh, Ukraine. Well, I, I, I completely agree, and we can learn from Munich 38 what happens if you let an aggressor unchallenged. It won't stop at Ukraine. So our values are at stake here, but also our collective security. So it is crucial that Putin loses and the Ukrainians win, uh, win this war, and that means including uh, all the military stuff we can get to you. The Netherlands is again pledging 2.5 billion for this year to help Ukraine through the war effort. And we will continue doing what is necessary because your fight is also our fight. And I feel this across Europe, including the United States and more and more also the Global South uh, coming on board. Uh, now we, at least we have over 140 countries supporting the UN resolution uh, against the Russian aggression. And collectively we have to build on that. And my simple argument always is this is colonization. And uh, in Africa, they are just coming out of colonization. So it's also their fight you are fighting. And uh, you are not alone. That's what I wanted to tell you. And what happened in Dnepro, and yesterday was the helicopter crash, is extremely sad and, and only uh, makes our resolve stronger to make sure that Zelensky and his team and the whole Ukrainian people will win this. Prime Minister, please. If I may just add one point, just for, to assure you. Uh, Croatia was also a victim of aggression 30 years ago. If I compare the European Union foreign policy of the time and today, this is not 30 years, this is 30,000 years change. We were under the United Nations arms embargo. And you have all the solidarity, nine rounds and nine packages of sanctions, incredible political unity, literally almost without a crack, and continuous and increased dynamics in uh, delivering 
military aid and weapons for Ukraine to defend itself and to defend, defend the values and freedom. And we will, uh, not uh, to the extent that Netherlands can do, but Croatia will continue to support China, as we have done so far. I'm afraid uh, we have run out of time, so I'm going to have to wrap this up. I will leave you with uh, two hopes. One is, when we meet again next year, that the war in Ukraine will be uh, over, with Ukraine having won. And the other is that we will be celebrating some progress on the Capital Markets Union. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you. Thank you.